We're back with Mark's story this week. Back to the brief descriptions and the urgency of the story. Back to the tension between the kingdom of God and the empire where all the powers gather in opposition. It all seems to be going so well. A crowd travelling with Jesus towards Jerusalem. And there's a sense of anticipation. That feeling you get as you walk towards a stadium for a final or for a concert. The excitement as fans mill around, the clicking of the turnstiles and the echoes of songs, that first view of the pitch or the stage as you emerge on the stairs, the colours, the opposing fans, the sounds as the buzz of the crowd is interrupted by drum beats and songs start, even the smells stick with you. Football cup final smell of smoke from flares mixed with beefy aromas from Bovril. It's in those moments that hope lives. All those possibilities yet to be realised or to be dashed. Of course, if you're an Aki's fan, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about, but take my word for it, that's what it's like. As the crowds come towards the last village before the city, Jesus sends a couple of his followers to borrow a donkey. When they just walk up and take it, the local neighbourhood watch ask, Hey, what are you doing? It's for Jesus. Oh, okay then. And that always makes me laugh. Two guys are basically carjacking a donkey, but it's okay because it's for Jesus. That tells us something, doesn't it? The people know who Jesus is. He's been here before. His friends, Martha and Mary and Lazarus, they live around here in Bethany. People know him and they know his reputation. It's the lead up to Passover. So all kinds of people would be travelling to Jerusalem for the festival. People would mostly be walking, but the occasional wealthier, important people would be there on the road on their horses or camels with their entourage. One of them would be the Roman governor, Pilate. Pilate had a palace in Jerusalem, but that's not where he lived. He spent most of his time at Caesarea Maritima by the coast, where the weather was much more bearable and where there was space. He was only in the city because the Passover was a celebration of a time when a bunch of slaves escaped their oppressors. As the latest in a long line of oppressors, the Roman governor knew what Passover was and was always going to be a time where tensions ran high and revolution was in the air. He would ride in, as the empire always does, in a procession that was really a show of force. Horses and armour and lots and lots of soldiers. People would be forced to move aside held back with swords and spears as the emperor's representative looked down on his subjects as they stood in silence, fearful of punishment. In complete contrast, at the other side of the city, here comes Jesus on a colt. That's not even a full-sized donkey. And the people are singing joyfully, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. A while back we heard Jesus ask his disciples, who do the people say I am? They thought maybe Elijah or Moses or John the Baptist. It's Peter that blurted out that he's the Messiah and Jesus tells him to be quiet, not to tell anyone. And that seems really strange because he is the Messiah, so why not tell everyone? Well, this is why. Not the blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, but that's fine. The David's new kingdom stuff though, that's a problem. The Messiah was supposed to restore the line of King David and free the people from oppression. The Messiah would be a warrior who would lead a revolution. But the people aren't tooled up for a fight, they're waving branches. Maybe they've actually understood Jesus. Maybe they finally get it. Maybe they've realised that violence just leads to more violence. So for now at least, it's all good. Hosannas and palm branches and smiling faces. But the parade stops at the city walls. Everyone knows that for a revolution to work, you have to control the capital. You have to be in charge of significant buildings. But the crowd don't get beyond the gates. Perhaps Peter would reflect on these strange events later. The city was busy, teeming with Passover revelers. Why did they all feel the need to come and welcome Jesus? 
we were hoping for once to keep a low profile. Tired of attracting big crowds wherever we went with Jesus, we thought at least, at least we'd have a quiet Passover. Thought everyone would be too busy. Busy with their own family, their own preparations. Too busy to take notice of ours. And it was also time that Jesus got out of the limelight. We could tell the authorities didn't like it. They were getting really antsy. It wasn't just Jesus. Though he kept attracting unwelcome attention, but all the people, it seemed, were getting pretty feisty and, and the authorities were getting nervous, clamping down on the most minor infractions. Definitely not the time to be processing into the city, even on a donkey. It was only a matter of time before a ban would be imposed on public gatherings, on demonstrations, the kind of thing that had been breaking out everywhere recently. So we hoped to enter the city quietly, to keep below the radar. But before we got anywhere near, we could hear the shouts, the shouts of a crowd, not angry, not insurrectionist shouts, but the shouts of revellers out for a picnic. Maybe, maybe they were hoping for more miracles, a healing or two, or to be fed some more of those amazing stories, the ones Jesus seemed to make up as he went along. Whatever they came looking for, they were not disappointed. There was Jesus, seemingly innocuous, riding on a donkey. But the people saw it as something different altogether. They always seemed to read into everything that Jesus did. They saw the mockery, even the subversion to the political era of oppression. Why was it Jesus they flocked to? Why turn their attention to him? Surely that day the people, they signed his death warrant as surely as if they'd shouted crucify him. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he went into the temple and when he looked around at everything, it was already too late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. A strange end to a strange day. But the looking around that Jesus does in the temple isn't a bit of sightseeing, it's the kind of looking around where someone stands in the middle of a room and glares their way around, meets every single pair of eyes, staring at everyone who's been whispering and plotting and planning to kill him. That's the kind of looking around that this is. It's more of a challenge. What? Do you have something to say? I didn't think so, but I'll be back soon. So the scene is set. The events of this darkest of weeks have been put into motion and there's nothing that anyone could do to stop them now. Something has changed in the air. There's some noise lacking. A cityscape of sound, people living, stalls selling, children calling, deals been done, but in all of the noise, silence has broken out. It's like something in the city is holding its breath. Like the heartbeat at the centre, pausing for a moment, hesitating. That was in the silence before, when the heartbeat paused, sensing that something, something has changed. Without this week, this journey from light into darkness and back to light, our faith means nothing. There can be no resurrection if there is no crucifixion. There is no eternal life if God's son does not die. There can be no forgiveness if there's no wrong done. This is Holy Week. And it's everything. They meet in the upper room before Passover and Jesus starts getting all strange. He washes the disciples' feet, an astonishing act of humility. Without this moment, there is no gospel. Without this moment, there's nothing that we can say about anything that can be believed. No doctrine can do this. No creed can make this happen. This is gospel. To love one another. And there's nothing more to be said. So keep quiet, all you scholars of tradition. You have nothing to say this holy week. Keep silent, you writers of doctrine. None of your ideas are important. None of you can say it so clearly. Love one another. On this and this alone, this week makes sense. 
Words hold power only because they describe an idea. Symbols are something else. Bread his body broken and wine a new promise. And then there's Judas. He slips out, sent by Jesus to do what has to be done. Out in the garden, Jesus prays. He sweats so hard that it's blood. Take it away, please God, not me. I'll do anything you want me to. Your will be done. Judas returns with the temple guards. There's a fight and a healing and suddenly Jesus is all alone. All his disciples have deserted him. Jesus has been here and gone. The echo of the betrayal still lingers in the darkness and the darkness seems a little darker here. But there's a gap in the darkness where the Son of Light once prayed, a crease in the air, like a warp lens through which we can see the fear ghost of the past that will shape our present. The kiss has been given and still ripples distort the scene where the Son of Humanity has been betrayed. This may be the first, but it's not the last. The path is now certain. The powers that be have chosen their way, chosen to complete the story. And Jesus has been stolen from us. Yet, my friends, with all that you can believe, conspire with a light, torn from us now, yet crumpled somewhere, ready to rise again. Conspire to believe that this is the turning of events, not the way love intends to leave things. The trial's a joke. Even Pilate can't see what Jesus has done, but the religious people convince him that Jesus is trouble, so they hand him over to the Roman soldiers who whip him and put a crown of thorns on his head and a purple robe on his back. Hail. Hail the King of the Jews. And they lead him to Skull Hill. And they nail him to a cross and they leave him there to die. It's almost Sabbath by the time Jesus yells, It is finished. Hope is gone. There will be no miracle on Friday. Just despair and pain and grief. There's a hole now in faith and the colour seeps from the image and even the sky slides towards monochrome. Birdsong moves from stereo to tin and eventually fades altogether. The colour is silent. The sound abandoned. And over this empty background, one phrase is enough to fill a thousand years with piercing clarity. Lama Sabachthani. It empties the memory of what grey and colour is still there. But now the light is gone and the darkness is complete. Not even shape is left, just a hole. This is faith. Enough. Enough. It is finished. <laughs>